So, for example, utilitarianism is going to be a form of heteronomy because utilitarianism takes the feeling of happiness or whatever, pleasure or satisfaction, to be intrinsically good. And so wills are going to, according to such a theory, are going to be constrained to pursue those ends, just to pursue those ends. So the source of morality on such a theory is found outside of the will, as a constraint on what the will should aim at, not found in its own self-legislating capacity, but rather found in external constraints imposed on it by what is taken to be intrinsically So what actually, um, what Kant actually thinks is that such heteronymous theories are all going to be forms of dogmatism. All of them are going to simply assert dogmatically with no further rational explanation that certain things are different. Certain ends are intrinsically good and therefore to be pursued. Why that is, no explanation is possible. We only dogmatically assert it, and therefore wills people should be constrained to pursue those things. So this is going to be a form of dogmatism. Um, notice that uh, I don't know, maybe divine command theory, where what morality is about is acting on God's command, God's choice. That also is going to be a theory of heteronomy. The source of morality is found in an external constraint on the autonomy of the will, and the choice of the will, given by something outside of it. So it's not only going to be utilitarianism, it's not also, it's a, Sorry. So heteronymous theories are not only going to be utilitarianism. Notice they're also not necessarily going to be teleological theories. So uh, a di divine command theory is going to simply say we can't do a certain thing because God tells us not to. Um, well, that's not necessarily maximizing anything. That's just obedience to God's choice. And that's going to be a theory of heteronomy also. Okay, so one more time. Here, Kant is characterizing moral theories as being theories of autonomy or theories of heteronomy based on where they find the source of moral law. Is that clear? Is that right? Okay. What I want to do very briefly is mention a more common interpretation of some of these passages, which I think is mistaken. But I want you to know what it is that often people say about these passages about autonomy and heteronomy. And I'm going to tell you why there's a problem with that interpretation. So in this interpretation, this is what I think is a misinterpretation, but is a common one. On this interpretation, um, we human beings have wills, but we also have inclinations that can diverge from these demands of practical reason. So far so good. The categorical imperative is a requirement of practical reason that says we must act only on certain maxims, which can be universalized. Um, but we also have the capacity to act on maxims that can't be universalized. We're not holy wills. We're not perfectly rational. Okay, so far so good. All that's all right. Here comes, here comes the problem. Here comes the problematic interpretation. On this interpretation, the thought is that whenever we act, we human beings who are not perfectly rational, whenever we act, we have a choice between two ways of acting. We either act autonomously, which we do when we choose principles that 
uh, act on principles that satisfy the categorical imperative. Or we choose, or we act heteronymously when we act to satisfy our, our empirical inclinations and ignore the demands of pure practical reason and specifically the categorical imperative. Um, so we act autonomously, maybe when we make an exception for ourselves and act to satisfy our inclinations or empirical desires in a way that not everybody can at the same time. Um, okay, so on this, I think, common interpretation, notice that the terms heteronymous and autonomous are what adverbs describe in different ways in which we can act. So an individual action may be a heteronymous act or an autonomous act. It'll be, an, on this view, it'll be an autonomous act if we are giving ourselves uh, the principle of action in accordance with the categorical narrative. It'll be, an odd, it'll be a heteronymous act if we give ourselves a principle of action that conflicts with the categorical imperative. Now, what's the problem with this? Forget about whether Kant actually says this or not. What's the problem with this as a substantive view? So the thought is that we're acting autonomously when we act in conformity with the categorical imperative. We're acting heteronymously when we act simply to satisfy our desires. The problem is that if we're only acting with autonomy, we're only acting in a way that gives ourselves a principle of action when we act in conformity with a categorical imperative. If we're only acting freely, and giving ourselves a principle of action when we act in conformity with the requirements of morality. Then the implication is that when we violate the categorical imperative, when we act immorally, we're not free. We're not giving ourselves a principle of action. Uh, that somehow our actions are caused not by our own free choice, but by our desire, our empirical desires or inclinations. So we're, as it were, pushed into acting that way. We're forced into acting that way. There's no responsibility for that choice because it's not really a choice. If the action is a heteronymous action, that means its source is found in something outside of us. Okay, so this means, on this interpretation, this means that we're only free when we're acting morally, and we're not free, and therefore not responsible, when we're acting immorally. Um, so, uh, this is, I claim, a mistaken interpretation. Um, first of all, because Kant does not use the terms autonomous and heteronymous to describe individual actions. He doesn't use these terms as adverbs to describe how we're acting. Um, um, he doesn't say that our actions taken individually are either autonomous or heteronymous. Um, he says that we have autonomous, or the will, we have autonomy, or the will is autonomous, simply because it has the capacity to give itself the law. Um, whether it does so or not on particular occasions, it still has autonomy. And in fact, in the Metaphysics of Morals, he addresses this explicitly. It's on page 97. Note, he says, any transgression of the law, so a violation of morality, acting in a bad manner, 
any transgression of the law can and must be explained only as arising from a maxim of the criminal to make such a crime his rule, the violator. For if we were to derive it from a sensible impulse, from mere empirical uh, inclinations, he would not be committing it as a free being, and it could not be imputed to him. So even when we act contrary to the moral law, we still have autonomy. We're still responsible for the maximum which we act in. Um, OK, so fundamentally, autonomy is a kind of will, one that can be moved by practical reason to give itself um, maxims that can serve as universal laws, that self-legislate. Um, and, and in contrast, we might say, if we want to call it this, a heteronymous will, if we want to think about this, would be something like a capacity to choose that's determined by external causes, determined by principles not of its own choosing. So, this is maybe stretching the idea of a will, but you can think of maybe, um, maybe a computer program that is designed to ease traffic jams, for example. So it's going to control traffic signals to ease traffic. And you might say that, on a particular occasion, that it chose to allow the eastbound traffic to go first. OK, so there's a sense in which there's a kind of choice there. But we don't think that that computer program gave itself any principles of action. It was wholly determined by principles not of its own choosing. Um, so moral theories can be classified based on whether they ground their principles in the idea of an autonomous will. Um, Last one, so um, on 54. Um, uh, and right at 444, the last paragraph, it is wherever an object of the will has to be made the foundation for prescribing the rule that determines it, whenever the object, the end of the will, is the basis for determining uh, choice. There, the rule is nothing other than heteronomy. The imperative, therefore, of such a heteronomous theory, saying you must do this in order to achieve that end, is going to be what? That kind of imperative of a heteronomous theory that says, act in this way, because doing so is going to bring about that good end. That imperative of a heteronymous theory is going to be hypothetical. Hypothetical imperative. You're never going to get a categorical imperative out of a heteronymous theory. Good. Okay, so on Monday we will quickly go through part three and then get started on the introduction to the metaphysics.